existing paradigm, the banking, financial, unregulated, globalized paradigm, they're out of options. The idea that quantitative easing was going to somehow jumpstart the economy has proven to be a complete fraud. We're seeing a contraction of physical production, physical trade, that the basis of the real economy is, is declining, including in the United States. And in Europe, they thought they could move toward a more unified banking structure, uh, run out of Brussels under this idea of a single resolution mechanism. That, that is that like Dodd-Frank was supposed to deal with how in the future we won't have bailouts. Uh, in fact, it's not going to work. In Europe, they took the Cyprus model from 2013 when they did bail-ins, when they started taking deposits. Uh, the banks could take the deposits and use it as part of their regulatory capital to have some liquidity. That is what was written into the EU law that was supposed to go into effect on January 1st. The problem is that there are two ways they do bail-ins. One is they sell bail-in bonds. Now, as you mentioned, with 0% interest rates or negative interest rates, you don't get any money leaving, uh, any income leaving money in a bank, whether it's a savings account or a checking account. So they're offering these bonds with 2 or 3%. But why would someone buy a bond knowing that if the bank gets in trouble, the bank will seize the bond? So that was insane to start with. The second option is they start taking a certain amount of depositors' money. That is, under the idea that a deposit is really an unsecure investment. Now, why would people leave money in the bank if they think the bank is going to seize their money? So interbank lending froze up in Europe starting January 1st, very much like in, in the summer, late summer of 2008. Banks, even with the 0% interest rate or negative interest rates, are illiquid right now because no one's trading. No one's buying the bonds. And so we're seeing the effect of that in the stock market collapse in Europe, which everyone is saying is because of China. And China is a factor in the instability, but that's not the real cause. Now, Deutsche Bank's problem in particular is they're heavily invested in derivatives. Outside of Citibank, Deutsche Bank has the largest portfolio of derivatives of any of the major banks. Now, these derivatives are supposedly backed or insured by credit default swaps, um, it's the so-called risk insurance, but this has never been tested. No one knows if these are even going to pay out, but meanwhile, they're trading credit default swaps. So they're trading instruments that are designed to insure other instruments that have nothing to back them up. So what's happened is the, the worst of all possible worlds where everyone realizes that bail-in won't work, the only solution is bailout, and bailouts haven't worked to clean up the problem. So Deutsche Bank is selling off assets like crazy. They're doing a fire sale. They own something called the Post Bank, which was originally offered for something like $4.6 now they're asking 2.8 billion. If you have 2.8 billion, you can buy a bank in Germany. Uh, but this is, the, the, the confidence is eroding. And you're seeing increasingly panicked articles in the Financial Times and the Daily Telegraph saying that capitalism as we know it is about to disappear and we don't know what to do. So that's the, what the crisis is with Deutsche Bank. When Deutsche Bank, or if Deutsche Bank completely falls apart and collapses, uh, what effect is this going to have on other banks? Well, interestingly, a figure from 2008 resurfaced today. John Mack, the former CEO of Morgan Stanley, who was there when Morgan Stanley was buying completely worthless instruments, he came out and said, look, the German government's not going to let Deutsche Bank go. The Bundesbank should just come out and say, look, we'll, we'll protect them. Uh, but first of all, why would you accept that kind of guarantee? And secondly, and this is what people have to understand, it's not just Deutsche Bank, it's the whole system. Deutsche Bank is completely intertwined in its derivative obligations with Citibank, with the Royal Bank of Scotland, with Santander, with BNP Paribas, uh, with Bank of America. Uh, what, what Thomas Honig who's the vice chairman of the FDIC, has been reporting 
the idea that Dodd-Frank and the, the European single resolution mechanism would work was a fantasy. It was based on the conception that one bank, if it fails, could be contained and there would not be contagion. Well, I got news for you. It's all intertwined. The contagion is already there. Just as in 2008, all these bankers know that they can't trust the paper that their own bank has written, much less the paper they've bought from other banks. And so that's why we're seeing the worst year ever, the start of the year in terms of stocks. The, you know, people should look at the stock market and see that it's a symbol of something. It's not so important in itself, except that the bubble, the stock bubble that was propped up by 0% interest rates is about to go. What's really a problem is that the promises that the quantitative easing would allow for new loans to go into productive investments in small and medium enterprises, a revival of manufacture in Europe and the United States, none of that has happened. And so behind this, this blizzard of paper, there's nothing. No guarantees mean a thing. And that's where we are with this financial system. And I mentioned it and you mentioned it about negative interest rates. And we see Japan went to negative. We see the ECBs in negative. Sweden just announced they're going to uh, go to negative interest rates. And one of the analysts in JP Morgan Chase, they did a little prediction of where they see the negative interest rates going. And they're bringing these interest rates very, very low, like to negative 4.5. They're even saying the U.S. might even go to negative 1.3. Why do they have to do this at this time? Well, the, the argument this J.P. Morgan Chase analyst said that it hasn't had a negative effect in Japan or Switzerland, so why would it have a negative effect here? Well, Japan is still completely stagnant and the Swiss people will put their money in Swiss banks even if they have to pay to do it. What people should know is negative interest rates means that you're going to have to pay to put your money in a bank deposit. You're going to be charged for the privilege of letting a bank seize your money. So the this is just desperation. Now the in the US we saw the panic that occurred when they raised the interest rates a quarter of a point back in December, and they promised three more increases during 2016. Now Yellen is backing away from that. She keeps saying, we have to see the data, we have to see the data. Well, I can tell you what the data is. The Dallas Fed, the New York Fed, the, uh, the uh, Minneapolis Fed, they're all putting out reports showing the shrinkage of production. And so when the president of the United States goes on television in the State of the Union address and says the economy is strong, people who say it's not strong or full of hot air, this is just a complete lie that is the line that's being put out there to stop a panic. Now, Dave, the important thing is there's no solution in the monetary realm. This is what they're beginning to realize. You can't jumpstart an economy with monetary policy. But that's all they have because we've decoupled the physical economy, the productive side of the economy, from the financial side. All the action is in the financial side. This is where they're saying the GDP is growing because derivative obligations are growing. Debt is growing. Uh, William White, the former chief economist for the Bank for International Settlements, said that the debt is unsustainable, and he's saying we need a jubilee, a, a debt write-down or cancellation. So when someone from the, the august BIS is saying we need a debt write-down, you get a sense of how deep the panic is going. But the, the real point is that this is where we've seen the, the shift from the 1960s and early 70s when we still had a productive economy, we had a space program, we had infrastructure investment. We still had the continuation to some extent of the New Deal uh, policies of Roosevelt through uh, John Kennedy. Once we started dismantling that, and under Bush Jr. and Obama, we've dismantled it at an accelerating rate, there's no bottom to the economy. And you can create all the jobs you want that are short-term, temporary, or, or low wage. That's not a recovery. And so we're paying the price for not having done what we should have done in 2008, which 
when, when Mr. LaRouche was among a few others who were calling for writing down the debt. Don't let the banks keep it on their books. And that was the mistake. So even if we write down the debt, is this going to solve the problem or is this just going to give us buy us some more time? Well, it depends on how you do it. Um, the debt's going to get written down one way or another. The question is, will it be a chaotic collapse or will it be an organized reor bankruptcy reorganization? Now, what Mr. LaRouche is proposing, which is, I think, the only solution, is go back to Glass-Steagall as a starting point, because what that would do is force banks to separate, put a wall between investment banking and commercial banking. And what that would mean is then you could protect the deposits. You wouldn't have bail-ins. You wouldn't have the possibility that a bank collapse will take away all your, your life earnings. Now, once you do that, then you have the investment banks start to write down the bad debt. You can give them time to do it. But what you're going to find is that the market value of the debt they're holding is vastly different from the face value that they're keeping on the books. But in this way, it's the investment banks that take the loss. And, and these things should be wiped out. This, this part of Wall Street uh, has become a cancer. And we need a form of uh, x-ray therapy or something to just wipe it out. But we have to protect commercial banking because just writing down the debt doesn't solve anything. You've got to figure out how to get new credit into the real economy. And this is where the idea of a Hamiltonian credit system, whether it's a national bank, but, but not a private central bank, but a national bank as in Hamilton's policy or what the Germans did after World War II with what's called the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, the, the Bank for Reconstruction and Development, what the Japanese did after World War II. That is government credit that goes into physical production so that you start increasing the amount of real wealth that's being created as opposed to shrinking that and increasing the funny money. So I think the, the steps are Glass-Steagall to wipe out the, the speculative banking system, let them take the losses. If, you know, if they can make money on it, fine, but they're not going to make money on it. Then secondly, you create a credit mechanism which will put people back to work. Those two steps will go a long way towards solving the problem. If we wait until a meltdown occurs, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a solution. And people who think, well, a meltdown will wake people up and then we'll get good solutions. You know, if you look out there, what you see is that as panic grows, people tend to become more irrational. If food starts disappearing from the shelves of grocery stores, what do you think is going to happen? So we have to have an organized reorganization as opposed to a complete uh, Schumpeter-style Austrian school collapse and let the, let the fit survive. Right now with uh, the U.S. government and Fed, uh, at this point, I, I don't even think they're looking at this as a possibility. Uh, because if we look at their whole entire fiscal policy, that they're just continually doing what they're doing, and they're just trying to put out fires and save whatever they possibly can at this point. And we're moving towards a complete, you know, destruction of the economy at, at this time. I mean, I, I don't see them looking at this at all. Well, Dave, all you have to do is look at the presidential race. Mm -hmm. Here we have the ideal opportunity for a real discussion. And outside of some of the, the screeching from Bernie Sanders, and some of what he's saying is definitely true about income inequality and Wall Street speculators, but then the reason I don't trust him is he then turns around and says, Obama's done a good job. <laughs> now, there's a disconnect there, which leads me to believe that he's not really serious about anything. But you look at Clinton, you look at the Republicans, they're not even discussing this. There's not a glimmer that the Republicans are saying, we didn't go far enough in deregulating. We didn't go far enough in uh, uh, opening up free markets and free trade. The push for the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the European Free Trade Agreement will make things worse. So among the establishment, Wall Street is controlling the, the message. They're controlling the discussion. Now, I think the, the votes for Sanders and Trump 
uh, and to some extent Cruz, reflect just a total rage at the political establishment. But rage is not a positive solution. No. And so you're right. The, you see, I think that there are people in the institutions who know their problems. You, you see it in some of the newspaper coverage, uh, someone like Ambrose Evans Pritchard of the Daily Telegraph, uh, you know, blogs like yours. There, there are people out there who know what's happening, but are frozen out of the so-called mainstream media. And so the average person uh, who doesn't have access to, to your report or some of the similar kinds of reports is left with a, a, a miasma. You know, how do I protect myself? What should I do with my money? And that's where you see the Wall Street is one. If they can keep alternatives from being discussed and convince people that you have to choose the lesser evil, then, you know, it's like, which of your kids do you want to throw off the sled to, to feed the wolves? You know, these are choices that people shouldn't have to make, but we've reduced the discussion. And, and this has a lot to do with the collapse of science, the collapse of industry, the collapse of a productive economy. We've reduced the discussion to how do I survive? And our nation was built on the idea of a higher unity, a higher harmony that's reflected by a government that actually acts for the people, not for private interests. And that's where we went off the rails. And I'm very nervous because even though everyone has, you know, their, their, uh, when they speak, they, their best intentions, it seems once they get elected and they're in the government, we see the central bank, corporations, foreign powers all start to take control of that, of the, the person who's in office and they're really running everything and and all the message and and everything that everything that they that they've said on their campaign completely disappears and we're back yeah. to where we started from yeah, you see it with the the clinton campaign i mean i don't know whether she has good intentions or not i i tend to be skeptical at this point of her but what she says is look we can't really have the things we want like get rid of private health insurance and go to a single payer you can't get that so you have to accept the crumbs now, the crumbs are coming from the corporations, the financial institutions, the insurance companies, Big Pharma and others, who are carving out huge profits at the expense of 90% you know, of us. So being practical uh, doesn't work. You have to take on the power. Now, there are people who talk about, can't we go to state banking? That would be crushed if it were in any state other than North Dakota. And state banking isn't working too well in North Dakota now because of the collapse of the oil prices. You've got to take on the Federal Reserve System, which is dominated by Wall Street. The New York Fed is calling the shots. And all this debate in the Federal Open Market Committee and so on is a, is a bunch of uh, smokescreen. The reality is that the whole financial policy of the United States is to protect these bankrupt, too big to fail banks. So that's the first problem. Now, the second problem is that these same financial institutions are behind the drive for war. You know, their basic argument, and it's not as simple as most people think, that they want the armaments money, the defense spending, uh, or war as a cover for uh, uh, financial collapse. That's, there's an element of that. But the bigger picture is that there's a whole section of the world that's rejecting the transatlantic financial model, that they're moving away from open banking and free markets and free trade, and instead looking at how you can have a global economy based on physical production. Uh, this is what the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, are moving toward. This is what the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, what the Chinese are doing. The Silk Road policy, which uh, the LaRouches had a lot to do with initiating as a, as a Western concept to work with the Chinese. What the Russians and Chinese are saying is, we don't want to, as, as Putin himself put it, why should I eat someone else's spoiled food? Let's produce something on our own. And this is why we're on the verge of, of confrontation with Russia and China. With the Asia pivot, we're threatening China and the South China Sea with the Ukraine crisis and now with Syria, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the NATO foreign ministers are meeting this week to carry out war games based on the assumption of what would happen if Russia invaded one of the Baltic countries, which Putin said will never happen because we're not crazy. But we're about to put 6,000 NATO troops on the border of Russia as part of a bigger guarantee that if Russia moves, we're going to have a backup for NATO countries. If Turkey comes into Syria, you're going to have a NATO country face to face with the Russian military. So these things are happening. Uh, and it's not just to take the attention away from, I mean, why risk a nuclear war to take the attention away from a financial collapse? They're trying to back Russia and China down from pursuing a new financial system that would break the existing dollar system because it's bankrupt. So this is where, you know, it's not just the danger of a financial chaos being unleashed, but a real possibility that we could face a war with Russia that probably would go to nuclear war very quickly. No, I agree with you. And just going back to Syria for a second, uh, we see that uh, the U.S. has launched uh, a couple amphibious warships and they're bringing them into the Pacific and the Middle East. Actually, it's the same warships that were used back in um, August of 2013 during the sarin gas um, yeah. uh, event right. back then. And we see that Saudi Arabia is continually saying, you know, okay, we'll, we'll, we have troops, we'll help out, we'll go into Syria. We see Jay Johnson from DHS is in Turkey helping them uh, create a uh, secure border by launching balloons, having uh, special uh, electronics to monitor the borders. And we're seeing a lot of this build up right now. And... Russia and the United States, they have two different missions there. We have Russia, which is actually um, fighting the Islamic State, and then we have the United States, which is actually backing the Islamic State to remove Assad. And right now, Russia is really destroying and removing and pushing the Islamic State out of the country, and the U.S. is kind of backed into a corner at this point. Where well, do you think they're going to go? I mean, I know they have the, the, the peace talks and they're trying to tell Russia, you know, we need a ceasefire right now. Where do you think this is going? Well, you point out the very well the irony in the situation where the Saudis, who are the largest funders of jihadist terrorism in the world, going back to the 80s with their alliance with George Herbert Walker Bush in Afghanistan, the Saudis are saying they want to be part of the anti-terror coalition. You know, that's, you know, the, the old joke of, uh, you know, the idea of the, the person who forms the anti-communist league in Iowa. And they say, well, there are no communists within 50 miles from here. And they say, yes, yeah, see how successful we are. The Saudis are the ones responsible for the terror. Yes. They're moving and, and they're being encouraged to move troops into Syria. The Turks are poised on the border to possibly move troops in. Why? because the Russian mission is being successful. They're driving out ISIS. They're driving out Al-Qaeda. The U.S. policy is a complete mess. You know, we claim we're fighting uh, ISIS, but for a year we were bombing the desert and meanwhile letting the, the ISIS move oil that they stole from Iraq and Syria into Turkey. The Russians came in and started blowing up those tankers. And then the Turks responded by shooting down a Russian jet and we responded, NATO responded, by threatening Russia. I think the key thing is that the way one of, the, one of my military sources put it, the calculus has been overturned by what the Russians are doing. And it exposed the fact that the war on terror under Bush and Obama had nothing to do with fighting terrorism. It had to do with conducting certain kinds of police state measures or implementing police state measures in the United States and in Europe. Uh, if you want to destroy something like ISIS, you start by cutting off the funds. Mm. That would mean not giving the Saudis a free hand. In fact, we are arming the Saudis. We just had another 1.2 billion arms sale to them. We're working with them to destroy Yemen, which is one of the poorest countries on the planet. And by destroying the rebellion in Yemen, we're turning over parts of Yemen to ISIS and Al-Qaeda. 
So everywhere you look, U.S. policy, go look, look, look at the Libya situation. We are defending and, and uh, developing this terrorist threat, which we're supposedly fighting. Uh, the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, said this is U.S. policy to allow for these terrorists to move and, and grow. So Russia changed that. Now, there are people in the Republican Party who say we've got to teach the Russians a lesson. Well, what do you do? Go to nuclear war with Russia? Uh, didn't we learn something from what happened in Ukraine? The Russians have actually been very moderate in their reaction to a neo-Nazi regime being put in power in Kiev and a coup against the democratically elected government. We're supporting the coups. We're bringing in terrorists and neo-Nazi regimes, and this is the Obama doctrine of regime change, which is the same as the Bush-Cheney doctrine. So what, what Mr. LaRouche points to is, where's this all coming from? This has nothing to do with U.S. national interests. Putin, in September at the U.N. General Assembly, said, why don't we work together in an anti-terror coalition? And Obama rejected that. What we're seeing is a financial empire that replaced the old British landed empire with a, a financial empire, global institutions, corporate cartels, dictating the government to, to governments what the policy should be on finance, on economics, and on strategic affairs. And if we don't break the power of this oligarchy, it's going to break us. Now, the good news on this, Dave, is that these guys are bankrupt. They're basically paper tigers. The, the Russians called their bluff in the Middle East, and we'll see what happens on this. But, you know, the, the problem is that unless Americans are called on to be bold and aggressive and stand up as patriots and fight for our, our real American system, our country is going to be used by this oligarchy as a battering ram against Russia and China to the point that we're going to end up in a nuclear war. Do you think the uh, ceasefire peace talks that are planned for March 1st, do you think anything is going to come out of that? Well, you know, the, the reason they didn't take place this last week was that the so-called Syrian opposition refused to go there because of the offensive in Aleppo. Now, some of the people who control Aleppo are the so-called moderate terrorists that the U.S. is supporting, uh, including al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda. But it's also ISIS is in Aleppo, and the Russians are, are conducting a siege, and they're, they're about to, you know, maybe a longer siege. It may not be that long, but they're, they're doing what they can to drive them out of that whole uh, northwest corridor in the border area with Turkey. Now, the argument of the United States, of Obama, is that well, we can't have negotiations while the war is going on. Well, the whole point of negotiations is to stop the terrorism, to defeat the terrorists. And if the opposition, the so-called Syrian Free Army, is allying itself, or portions of it are allying, its, allying itself with al-Nusra and ISIS, then we should be fighting them. Instead of a ceasefire, we should be backing the existing government, bring down the terrorism, and then let the Syrians decide what they're going to do. But this is where you see an empire that, that is refusing to do that. So as to the March talks, you know, if Aleppo is, is if the siege of Aleppo is over by March 1st, the U.S. may have no choice. This is why the possibility of the Turks moving in is so dangerous, because that could escalate what otherwise appears to be a winding down with ISIS and al-Nusra about to be defeated. So what is the U.S. going to do at this point? I mean, they're in Syria because of terrorism for the Islamic State. And if Russia is continually pushing them out of Syria, what would be the justification for the U.S. to be in Syria? Well, the only justification has been to get rid of Assad. It's regime change. And the irony of this is that you look at one of the reasons the Europeans are more open to negotiating with Russia now, and they, some of them want to get rid of the sanctions on Russia, is that they're being overrun by refugees. Now, Obama said it's the Russians that caused the refugee crisis. The fact is, or Assad that caused the refugee crisis, the fact is 
that for many years when Assad was uh, the president, before the civil war, there was no clamor of people to get out of Syria. The, the clamor to get out was when ISIS and Al Qaeda started taking over cities and butchering people, including fellow Muslims, as well as Christians and others. So instead of recognizing the ending of the civil war means you cut off flows of arms to the terrorists, Obama's policy is to continue to arm the terrorists, continue to build up the idea of an opposition force to Assad. And this comes from people like Susan Rice and uh, the NSA advisor and Samantha Power, the so-called humanitarian responsibility to protect advocate at the UN. This is the old Brzezinski, Madeleine Albright faction in the Democratic Party, which goes back to the same imperial policy that the British had in World War I. Create artificial countries, blow them up periodically, and this is how you keep control over the region. And on the Republican side, it's the project for a new American century, the so-called neocons. And the neocons and the liberal imperialists have the same damn policy. And this has nothing to do, as I said, with American national interests, with protecting the rights of people in Syria. Uh, it has to do with a geopolitical doctrine, which is dangerous and crazy. And the problem is Hillary Clinton supports it, as do all the Republicans. They support the same geopolitical doctrine. And unless we break from that, uh, the likelihood of a ceasefire holding will depend on two things. One, Russian military success, and two, a section of the U.S. military which doesn't support the Bush and Obama doctrine and which actually is hoping that the Russians succeed because they don't want to have to deploy U.S. boots on the ground in this region. Well, what makes me very nervous is that we've seen the weaponry of Russia with their uh, S-400 and now S-500 defense uh, missile system, plus their electronic jamming uh, devices. And it seems that they have very capable weapons compared to the U.S., where we have the F-35, which is kind of a lemon. And a lot of our weaponry is quite old at this point compared to what Russia has developed. Do, no. you, th do you think they're a little nervous about, uh, especially the Pentagon, going up against Russia because of their weaponry? We have two types at the Pentagon. One is the General Dempsey type, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who were involved in Iraq and who saw the, the, the fraud of U.S. policy there, who don't want to have a war, who want to have negotiations and discussions with the Russians. But you also have a group that, that goes back to McNamara and the, the Wiz Kids and the Utopians, who are trying to de devise what the Germans, what the Nazis called the Wunder uh, Waffen, the wonder weapons. These are people who are now behind Obama's call for a trillion dollar modernization of our nuclear force to, to make more precise, uh, smaller nuclear weapons that are, that's going along with a U.S. cyber warfare capability that some of these idiots actually think, and Ash Carter, the defense secretary, is in this group, they think that we could win a nuclear war that we could do a, a precise first strike against Russia, and then we could use cyber warfare to disrupt their response. Now, that's why someone who I've never had much use for, uh, former Defense Secretary William Perry, has been coming out recently warning of the danger of nuclear war with this launch on warning doctrine, the nuclear modernization, the expansion of, of NATO to the Russian borders, People like Henry Kissinger, you know, are coming out, you know, people who are really not good people saying this shouldn't happen. Gorbachev is warning about it. Uh, former German chancellors Kohl and Schroeder are warning about it. So there's a group of people who you might call realists, who in, you know, are not necessarily good people, who are warning about this. Theodore Postel, who was Reagan's nuclear security advisor at the end of Reagan's second term when the Soviet Union was collapsing, has been very vocal about this warning. So these are not leftists like Noam Chomsky, who also is saying the same thing. These are people connected to the military warning about this danger. So, you know, it's, you, you wouldn't want to see a military coup 
but they should be going to the Congress and they should be going to various institutions and saying Obama is losing his mind and, and we have to use the 25th Amendment to remove him from office before he gets us into a nuclear war. Now, uh, the problem is you can't count on that. So it, it's really essential that the anger and the buildup, the pent up anger of the American people find a, a positive direction. And you know, just to, to shift gears for a moment, what we're launching is a renewed call for a revival of NASA. Not just because the Chinese are on going to the moon, they're going to explore the dark side of the moon, not just because we want to have uh, manned space missions, but because we have to reinvigorate the spirit of America, which had the view that we can do things that are considered impossible. This was the spirit of the new frontier of John Kennedy. This is the idea that, that we can go where we hadn't gone before and that we can do it with science and technology. And the problem in the last 40, 50 years, most of our technology has been toward miniaturization to the so-called smartphones and these kinds of gadgets, which really aren't so smart and have made us more stupid because of our reliance on social networking as a way of finding worth, as opposed to inspiring young people with a vision of their capability to develop their creativity to explore new horizons and to come up with solutions to the problems that have been bedeviling mankind for centuries, disease, famine, uh, water management, things of that sort. So that's the potential. And so it's not just we have to go out there and stand on a mountaintop and denounce the banksters and the oligarchs. We do have to do that. But we have to give a positive vision of where America can go. And I think the calls that, that Mr. LaRouche and uh, one of my associates here in Texas, Keisha Rogers, who won several Democratic primaries calling for impeaching Obama and going with NASA. These were Democratic primaries she won. That There's a resonance in the population for this kind of boldness. And I think now is the time that we have to strike to put forward these kinds of positive programs. Harley, I, I completely agree with you. I, I believe this is a start of a movement, but it has to grow. And the way the world is right now, a lot of things have to change uh, because what we're seeing right now, those in power, those controlling everything, many of these individuals um, need to go. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we need to change the power structure of government to really get anything done, um, especially having a government that actually supports the people and yeah. growing the population and growing the next generation. And with what we have right now, I don't see it happening. I think there, there has to be a huge movement and a huge change and of course, it has to start from somewhere. It just doesn't matter. No, it's going in the opposite direction now. We're seeing an increased death rate among people 25 to 54 year olds, white people, from suicides and from drug addiction, alcohol addiction, which in many cases is another form of suicide. Uh, the rest of the world is reducing death rates in this age group. In the United States, it's increasing. In some cases, threefold between 25 and 34 year olds because there is no hope for the future. Now, you know, it's sort of like you're sitting in the back of a bus and you look up and you see that the bus driver is passed out and the bus is going full speed toward a cliff. Do you sit in the back and wait to see what's going to happen or do you run up and grab the steering wheel? And we've got a situation where most people lack the confidence to know what the solutions are. And this has to do with this 40-year drift in the post-industrial economy into so-called environmentalism, which has nothing to do with the environment. Uh, the demographics are terrible in terms of, you look at Western Europe and you have an aging of the working population and you don't have young people that are moving in to take the job. Same in this country. So the crisis is here. and. You know, I, I think I, I commend you for what you're doing, reaching out to an audience, giving them alternatives. And, you know, I'd like to encourage your listeners 
to go to my website, theroofpack.com, where we put up two videos, three videos a week with discussions on these things, including discussions with Mr. LaRouche, where we have uh, a lot of news and information, but also a programmatic section that, that gives people an understanding. For example, what is the bailout? We wrote an article back in 2013 about how Dodd-Frank Section 2 makes... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Dave, you there? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Yes, yes, I hear you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. That, okay, we prepared, we wrote an article in 2013, which is available on our website, about how Dodd-Frank includes the bail-in as the law of the land. People didn't know that. Nobody knew it. No one read it or they didn't say anything about it. So I think our website is a, is a very useful place for people to look for this kind of programmatic alternative. Harley, thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate you. Thank you for coming back on here and giving us all this valuable information. It's my pleasure. and I, I hope that uh, your listeners avail themselves of what they're getting from you because we are a couple minutes to midnight on the nuclear war clock. <laughs>